<laughs> yep, we're starting a little early. Welcome to the Rotary Club of Tulsa, where service above self is more than a slogan, it's a way of life. Here at the Rotary Club of Tulsa, we're serving the needs and making a difference here in Tulsa and around the world. And thank you for joining us today on this soggy, soggy day. We have a packed program today, so we're going to jump right into it. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Lukak is going to do our invocation. Carl Vincent is going to lead us in our four-way test and pledge. And then past president Ed Monette is going to introduce our visitors. Tom. Thank you, Mike. Let us pray. Gracious, loving, and ever faithful God, help us to make your spirit visible in all we do as Rotarians, that we may go into the world and be of service to all people. May we use those skills you've equipped us with for teaching, nurturing, and guiding others, that our lives may be improved by our, our actions and that we may comfort those who are hurting and give us the courage to risk ourselves so that all people may have a better life. We pray for the long-term recovery efforts in places that have experienced natural disasters and specifically for those affected by the wildfires in western Oklahoma. And help us to know how we can best serve our state and country with the example that Dr. Coburn has shown and the message he is sharing with us today. May we thank you each day for your presence, your guidance, and your gift of life itself. Amen. Welcome again to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. Today we're going to run through the four-way test, which will come up on the screen here momentarily, I really hope with all my heart. Following that, I will turn and we will do the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> oh, we don't need it up there. <laughs> do we? Do we have the four-way test? There we go. So join me, please. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Join me with the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Welcome everyone to the Rotary Club of Tulsa. For those of you not keeping track, that is you've been welcomed three times in three minutes. So we are, uh, we are glad you're here. Uh, as is our custom, I will introduce the host Rotarian. If they will stand briefly with their guest when their name is called and then sit back down, we will hold our applause and welcome you all with a round of applause at the end. Rotarian John Stava has with him Kurt Helen with Stava Corporation. Somewhere, right? Rotarian Carrigay Neal has Kelly Bailey with her with Sparks Reed Architects. Mike Homand has Jenny Hammock with BKL. Rotarian Rob Berry has two guests, Bob Frame with MedPlan and Bruce Walker with Energy Control. Rotarian Barney James has brought Dave Thomas with Brothers and Company. Phil Viles has with him Byron Burke, an upcoming Red Badge recipient, by the way. Rotarian Ken Snoke has his wife, Georgia. John Halland has with him Cassie Moon with Signal Factory. Tom Hardcastle has Mike Bullock. Tina Miller has with her Rondell Wilson with Tulsa Job Corps. Curtis Craig has Charles Craig with Meliora Capital. John Brock has with him Matt Pinnell. Jason George brought his wife Jamie. Uh, John Range brought his wife, wife Kathy and a friend, April Roth. Jack McGlumphy has Donna McGlumphy. Brad Anthematten brought with him Bill Anthematten. Scott Filstrup has two guests, Rick Stearns and Chris Rothermel, who I believe is Senator Coburn's son-in-law. Let's give them all a round of applause. Three visiting Rotarians from the Sunrise Club, the son of Jan Johnson, Eric Johnson. Hello, Eric. From the Owasso Club, Andy Coleman. Hi, Andy. And from the Sunrise Club, Phil Jackson. Hi, Phil. Thank you all for being here. Please come back. 
Thank you, Tom, Carl, and Ed. And this is the fourth. Welcome guests. We're glad you're here today. If you're looking for some place where you can work alongside Tulsa's finest business and community leaders and serve your community, this is a place. And uh, we hope you'll consider joining us as we serve the needs of those around us and make, it, make a difference. Uh, public service announcement here, if I may. Today is Professional Administrative Day. If this is the first time you've heard about this, you can thank me later. But if you, if you have not done the appropriate thing for the people at your office, this afternoon would be the time. Okay, we want to thank this week's meeting sponsors whose sponsorships help defray the costs of running our club. Bob Parker with Robert E. Parker Attorney, Forrest Cameron with the Greater Tulsa Reporter Newspapers, Chris McCowan, Small and Associates Financial, and Terry Lawson with Vision Source Tulsa. We encourage you, as always, when you have business needs, to think of your fellow Rotarians first. And then in addition to today's sponsors, let's also thank all of our meeting volunteers whose service helps our meetings run smoothly every week. Thank you. <laughs> we have two committee meetings after our meeting today. The Budget Committee is meeting in room 231, and Above and Beyond is meeting in room 232. We now have two new members that we're going to get introduced to. Eddie Barclay, who is sponsored by Josh Harlan, Herlin, sorry Josh, and then Mike Corey, who is sponsored by Jane Carlson. If you all wanna come up here, while they're coming up, uh, John, thank you again for conducting today's new member orientations, we appreciate you. Josh? <laughs> Come on up here, buddy. For the fourth time, welcome, Rotary. Five. <laughs> Please allow me to introduce my friend, Eddie Barclay. Eddie was introduced to me by a friend of mine uh, four or five years ago. Uh, we're very pleased to know Eddie has the heart of a servant. He uh, grew up in Berry Hill, Oklahoma. Started off by filling potholes for the Tulsa County, and now he's the director of Tulsa County Highway. If you have any road problems, I have his mobile number. <laughs> you get that all the time. Eddie, welcome to the club. I know you'll be a great, uh, great addition and a great servant to our organization. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. Mike Corey is a remarkable young man. Like many of us, he left Tulsa only to find that there's no place like home. In 2014, he and his wife Katie recruited a partner from Dallas and started Caring Transitions. He serves older adults in our community that are ready to downsize and start a new chapter in their life. It is my honor and pleasure to introduce you to Mike. He's a dependable, compassionate, and a great family man. Mike, you're sure. Here is your badge, red badge, your four-way test, Thank and your rotary pin. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mike, Eddie, thank you for joining us. We look forward to uh, all that you're going to do in the club, please we encourage you to get active. We've got some great opportunities for you and I look forward to working alongside you. Okay, so we have a couple announcements. First, we have a big announcement on the Henry P. Iba <coughs> banquet coming up. Uh, as we know, the, the Iba committee has already announced this year's M MC, who will be Dave Hunziker, the voice of the Cowboys, go Pokes. And the keynote speaker will be Doug Gottlieb from Fox Sports Radio. So to tell you more about the 25th annual IBA Awards Banquet, our major fundraiser for the Rotary Club of Tulsa Foundation is this year's chair, Tricia Kirkstra. Tricia. Thank you, President Mike. 
Yes, you are correct. This is our only major fundraiser. Last week, we all heard about all the wonderful things that our foundation does. We can't do that without our major fundraiser, the IBA dinner. So for those of you who have already purchased your sponsorship, <coughs> tickets, made your donation to the dinner, thank you. I really appreciate it. For those of you who have not, there's a little form on the table. It's been there every week, and we highly encourage you to please support our foundation through the IBA dinner. You can buy a table, a ticket. There's a little place at the bottom. You can just make a donation. You don't have to do what it says. You can make a donation that you're comfortable with, but it is important for everybody to participate as much as possible. Right now, we're about 20 tables short of what we need, and we do need all of our tables in by May 9th. So try to take this home with you today and take care of that. We really appreciate it. So Monday, uh, June 18th, 2018, Hard Rock Hotel and Casino, and the celebrity reception is on the top floor, and then the general cocktail reception is next to the ballroom. So hope to see you there. So it's my pleasure today to officially announce um, uh, to introduce John Klein with the Tulsa World, and he's going to make the announcement, as is our tradition, of who our female honoree is. So as he makes his way to the stage, let me introduce you to him. Uh, John has been with the Tulsa World for 36 years. He joined as a sports writer in 1978, spent five years at the Houston Post uh, while he was covering the Southwest Conference, and then he returned to the Tulsa World in 1990. He has been a sports editor, a senior sports columnist, and he's now a news columnist uh, at the Tulsa World. John is a member of the Oklahoma Journalism Hall of Fame, the Oklahoma chapter of the National Wrestling Hall of Fame, and the Perry High School Hall of Fame. He is no stranger to the IBA Awards, um, and he personally uh, knows our female recipients. So please join me in welcoming John Klein. I see a number of my colleagues from the Tulsa world here today. I don't think they're here to see me. <laughs> could, could be wrong. Uh, and as a member of the Perry High School Hall of Fame, I can tell you anything you need to know about ditch witches and high school wrestling. So look me up afterwards. <laughs> Thank you, Tricia. It's my pleasure to announce that this year, for the first time, there'll be two female recipients of the IBA Citizen Athlete Awards. I've had the privilege of interviewing them, knowing them for many, many years. The first recipient will be Dale McNamara. There was no women's golf team at the University of Tulsa when Dale attended college, so Dale entered tournaments on her own as an individual, became the first woman to win an athletic letter at TU. As an amateur player, she was unbelievable. She won a record seven Oklahoma State amateur golf titles. She's been inducted into the Women's Golf Association Hall of Fame. In 1974, until you decided to start a women's golf team, of course, Dale volunteered to coach it. They had no money, no support, no players, but they did have Dale, and that's a pretty good thing to have. During her 26 years of coaching at TU, she developed Golden Hurricane Golf into a national powerhouse, winning four national championships. Think about that for a second. All the great coaches you know in this state, we got lots of them. Name all of them that have won four national titles. That's pretty great. One of her star players was her daughter, Melissa, who captured the individual championship in 1988. One of the most emotional things anyone could have ever seen. It was, it was a great moment. Melissa McNamara Llewellyn, will be the second female recipient of the IBA Award this year. Prior to college, she was a three-time Oklahoma High School State Champ, two-time Women's Oklahoma Golf Association Girls Junior Champ, the 83 WOGA State Amateur, 83 AJGA Player of the Year. I mean, you can tell she won a lot of stuff. As a player at TU, she won medalist honors at four tournaments, recorded 22 top 10 finishes, 41 career events. After graduating, Melissa competed on the Futures and Ladies European Tours in 1989 before qualifying for the LPGA Tour in 1989. She spent 11 years on the LPGA Tour, winning the 1991 Stratton Mountain LPGA Classic. She also won the J.C. Penney Classic, paired with PGA player Mike Springer. In 2000, uh, Melissa succeeded her mother's head women's golf coach at TU. Her two seasons, she led her team to seven tournament titles 
including back-to-back -back Western Athletic Conference and NCAA Regional Championships. She had a very successful stay at Arizona State, where she led the program to an NCAA team title, making her and her mother the only mother-daughter to have both won NCAA titles. Very cool thing. She's now the head coach at Auburn. The team made a return trip to the NCAA Regionals and saw three players in individual tournament wins last year. I, I can't say it well enough. I've been around the Iowa Awards for a long time. I've been coming from pretty much the start. And very few times I, I, I see all these wonderful people you honor, and I love what you do, but these are people in our hometown. And I think that makes this year even spe more special. What a dynamic duo, Melissa Mac er, uh, Dale McNamara and Melissa Llewellyn, the 2018 female recipients of the IBA Awards. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Tricia, and thank you, IBA committee. This, this is monumental. I think, I think kudos to you for having two female athlete recipients this year, and as John said, pointed out, two of the best that we could have ever picked. So this, this is awesome. John, thank you for coming and making this announcement. We appreciate you. As Tricia said, I would encourage you to buy your tickets uh, I've been to most of the IBA awards, and it, it's an evening like none other. Uh, my wife is not a big sports person. <clears throat> she puts up with me on sports, but she is touched every year that we've gone to these, to these awards, and she's always glad that we went. So uh, it's a great place to see all the good that, that is, that's going on out, out in the world out there. So buy your tickets, please. Okay, next announcement is about the, I got to make sure I get this right, Rotary, Roses, and Rosé Garden Cocktail Party. I thanked Becky last night for this title of this. Uh, as we know, all know, you know, Rotary is all about uh, building relationships. And uh, the membership committee would like to invite everyone to attend the Rotary, Roses, and Rosé Garden Party on Thursday, May 17th from 5.30 to 7 uh, at the very infamous Lycom residence. And Kip, thank you again. Kip has been so generous in do donating his house to us, and it's a beautiful place. Uh, the event is free, and it's uh, graciously sponsored by Lycom Investments and Mabry Bank. Everyone's invited to attend. The only request is that you bring a guest, or hopefully a prospective Rotarian. There will be no formal presentation. This is just a good old fashioned networking event where we can spend some time on a smaller scale visiting. It's a come and go event. There are only 50 spots available though and this was just put out in the newsletter on Monday and I've heard that we already have at least half of the slots filled. So if you want to be part of this prestigious group at the infamous Lycom residence, I would encourage you to sign up quickly. Get, uh, you can contact Becky Fields and she'll make sure you are on the select invitee list. Okay, Sir Charles, yes, sir. Sarge time. Well, I tell you, Kip and Becky together, forget it, that's crazy with a K. Those two. I mean, I'm just crazy you with a K. Yes. Oh, you haven't? I just brought my phone up here. And you need to be there, man. We missed you last week. Yeah, I, uh, I'm training busy. people. Can you believe that? That's You're training people. You train people. Really? I don't know. You guys training them to... Training them to do what I do, which is get outside and meet people. Oh, not your rotary training. This no, is it's outside other, rotary Your other training. persona. Okay. Yeah, it's, okay. it's, it's incredible, and nobody got hurt, and uh, <laughs> I do have some front-end problems on my car, but I was just showing off, so we'll just see <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing? Good to see everybody, all the fun faces out there. Let's get the game started. Right off the bat, uh, you know, we got John O'Connor with a $25 fine. Edmonette finally pays off bet with John O'Connor on the recent OSU and OU basketball game. And I think John, <laughs> there you go, Ed. I know that was tough on you. But more importantly, John, if he does take this position as, uh, you know, with the government, he's going to need the 25 bucks. So, uh, <laughs> isn't that right? Yeah. Possibly, uh, so. possibly so. Okay. <laughs> Just want to make sure. Okay. Sure how long the checks will be. 
<laughs> All right, next up, Del Snowbarger. Burger, where are you, Del? Are you hiding out there? There you are, Del. $100. Do you want me to announce how well you look for your age? I mean, can you believe 76, right? That's amazing. No, no way. Yeah. Really? Isn't that crazy? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody's in shock. You hear how I've replied to it? <laughs> 76, 76 birthdays, $100. Thank you, Dale, very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> Everybody got so quiet. I think everybody's afraid I'm going to say their birthdays, but I might. All right. Next up, the lovely Diane Peacock. Diane, I know I saw you somewhere hiding out there. There you are. Very good. All right. So she says, happy birthday. $100, $50 for a birthday, and then she put this thing in there, uh, the little white lie. Uh-oh. Oh, it's for your 50th birthday. Okay, well, very good. Well, there you go. There's the will. See? There you go. $50, $50. We're good to go. Thank you very much. I hope you had a wonderful birthday. <laughs> All right, next up. Huh. Oh, look at that. Uh, there's no fine on that. There's not a reason to... That, that, that is the most beautiful grandbaby you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> Isn't she gorgeous? Well, yeah, she's a cutie and everything, but you do realize that I think there's supposed to be a fine if you're going to self-promote. Oh, that didn't make it on there, though. Yeah. All right. She's three months old now. Yeah, three yep. months old. Okay, well... We I'm slid that one in there, didn't we? <laughs> Congratulations, Mike. Appreciate you. All right. I just figured everyone, would, we haven't seen her in about two or three weeks, so I figured everyone wanted to see her. Oh, well, we'll put a missing person <laughs> for report. All right, next up, Scott, I saw you over there. Scott Filstra, thank you so much. $5,000 fine for his 76th birthday. That, maybe I'm getting this backwards. Okay. Peace. Taking care of Camp Enterprise, the IBA 25th. You've got Crescendo taken care of, as well as Polio Plus. Just wonderful, Scott. Thank you so much for the donation. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I don't know about the rest of you all, and I think this is what's coming up next. I do drive around quite a bit, and the bottom line is uh, I think the city of Tulsa right now is having multiple bypass, like a heart surgery. <laughs> and, uh, and then what's what bad is ODOT then mocking us with these signs. <laughs> so anyway, uh, hopefully these orders will get cleared up pretty soon, but nonetheless. All right, well again, thank you for keeping me in mind when you have those fines that you wanna send our way. So with that said though, I'm gonna segue, because I'm not a fast enough talker. Ed, would you mind up coming up here and helping me out a little bit? We have got some tickets to give away, and I will be your uh, pointer and I'll let you take over. Thank you, Charles. Um, Mr. Ed, Ed Verheller, was supposed to do this. And uh, as everyone knows, anyone by the name of Ed can do an auction. So they called and asked me to do this. Um, what we have tying in with Trisha's announcement as a uh, benefit for the IBA Awards, Phil Viles graciously donated for this weekend's Bedlam OU OSU baseball game right here at Driller Stadium four, not one, not two, not three, but four box seats for both the 7 p.m. Saturday game and the 3 p.m. Sunday game. Wow. Weather Thank is you, guaranteed Phil. to be perfect. It's a wonderful day for baseball. As we know, and these aren't just regular box seats. These are Phil Vile seats. And as we know Phil Vile, these are the real deal. Probably the only way to get better seats is to put on a uniform and get out there and play. These are the real deal. Jason George has kicked in, thanks from the drillers. VIP parking passes, two passes for each day. He's also kicked in a beautiful crimson driller's shirt and a oh-so-hideous orange <laughs> driller's shirt and a more, that will more go beautiful. to the winner of these auctions. These are priceless. You will probably be treated with the, by, like a king, knowing that you're sitting in Phil Vile's box. <laughs> it's like uh, the queen at Royal Albert Hall. People will be waving at you. It'll be a big deal. So... Um, we're going to start the bidding. It's for all eight tickets. So remember, it's four each time. We're going to do them all at once. So if you guys can go, pardon me? Split, we'll buy them and then split them. I, we can't, I don't have time to like eight auctions, Brad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to we do one time. auction. Yeah, you guys split them that. however you yeah, want to do it. Control. So here's it. Brad, come on up here. You handle this. You're going to do this. Dad gum it. All right. Let's start this deal up. All eight tickets, fill vial seats. 
probably don't even use them, just frame them to say that you had Phil Vile seats. These are just cool as could be. Let's start the bidding at 100 bucks. Do I hear anyone wants to give 100? We got 100 bucks right here. I got 100, do I have 150? Anybody want to go 150? Oh, John got 150. 150, Curtis, you want to go up to 175? I got a 175. One, I got, up. Oh, Kip Lackham, it's at one. Charles, come on, be quicker. 175, yeah, does Brad. anyone want to go 200? 200, Brad, 200, Brad's oh my goodness. Two. Great, all right, 250. We got 250 somewhere, we got 200, we got 250 over there. Do I hear 300? We're at 250, Anthem Atten's got 300, good job. But 300, we have 350. 350, 350, we have 300, we have 300, we have 350, 350, 350. All right, Tim, good job. What, three, we have 350, no, we have 300. What are we, 350? <laughs> 350, all right, how about 400? All right, these are big numbers. Four, three, <laughs> three, looking for 400, anybody got 400? 400, We should 400, have had an 400? OSU guy Oh, we here. got it, thank you, Tim. 450, we're at 400. Oh, Antimatin's at 450. Do we have $500? Anybody want to give $500 for the greatest two days of your life? All right. 500 bucks, Tim. Thank you. Do we I have 550? 550? 550? Right. 550? We have 500. Do we have 550? 550? 550? 550? Just a little bit more than 500. 500? <laughs> Do we have 550? We'll go one, Come two, on. three. Sold to Tim Nall. Very Woo! good. Thank you. I don't think Tim will want that red shirt, but. All will right. you really? That's disappointing. Thank you, Ed. Great job. I guess if we realize the numbers are going to get that big, we probably should have had an OSU person up here helping you out, right? Yeah. Just saying. I'm just saying. We all know it's true, but I said it. Okay. Thanks, Ed. We appreciate you. Okay. Now our vocational minute with Bill Richard. Bill. Please tell me. Yep. Oh, great. Sat in the back of the room. That's okay. That does, you're, the clock doesn't start till you get at the mic. Yes. Yes. Fire away, buddy. Prison, Mike. Good afternoon. I'm, I appreciate all you guys showing up on a rainy Wednesday. I'm sure it was to hear more about Richard Properties. So, <laughs> so anyway, we'll have a minute. Uh, Richard Properties, I've, I've been in business here in Tulsa for about 44 years. And... Uh, our primary focus is, um, is on investment properties, uh, site selection for companies, and uh, development and redevelopment type properties around uh, Tulsa, Northeast Oklahoma. Uh, what we normally like to do is, is counsel with our clients so that we can find out what their goals and objectives are in the uh, real estate business and see if we can uh, find something that meets those, uh, those goals. The key is to listen, so we try to do that. Um, we do acquisitions and sales, obviously, sale leasebacks uh, for companies that want to uh, uh, raise capital. Uh, we do 1031 exchange uh, transactions to minimize tax uh, consequences and a number of other types of, uh, of uh, deal structures. So anyway, we'd, uh, we'd love to work with you if you have a real estate need and uh, we look forward to uh, to uh, more uh, business. Anyway, and I'll yield the rest of my time to the senator. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Thank you. 44 years in business. That's amazing. Well done. Well done. Okay, and now we're going to introduce our Rotarian of the Day, past president Del Dreyer. Del joined our club in 1982, and he is a uh, Community Foundation Fellow, a Paul Harris Fellow, and he was a trustee of the Rotary Club of Tulsa Foundation. Please join me in welcoming to the podium, Del Dreyer. Thank you, President Mike. It's my honor today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Tom Coburn. Dr. Coburn graduated from Oklahoma State in 1970 with a degree in accounting and he immediately began working as a manager in a manufacturing plant for the family business Colburn Optical in Colonial Heights, Virginia. Eight years later, the business was sold and Dr. Colburn moved his family back to Oklahoma. With a new interest in medicine, he enrolled in the University of Oklahoma's College of Medicine, earning his medical degree three years later. Following board certification, he established a family medical practice in Muskogee, where records say he delivered over 4,000 babies. That's when they quit counting. 
1994, Dr. Coburn ran a successful campaign and was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives representing Oklahoma's 2nd District. Beginning in 95, Dr. Coburn served 16 years in Congress with six in the House of Representatives and the last 10 in the Senate. He resigned his position from the Senate two years prior to the end of his term. During his time in Congress, he consistently sought to reduce the size of government, stop wasteful spending, and balance the budget. Dr. Coburn has been married to Carolyn, or will be, 50 years, the end of this year, in December, I think he told me. They have three children, and they now live comfortably in South Tulsa. Please give Dr. Coburn a warm rotary welcome. No. Sit down. Have a seat. Have a seat. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't know there was so much OSU, OU uh, rigmarole here. I would have worn my uh, Croins jersey. Uh, <clears throat> not many people get to be in politics and from both schools in Oklahoma. I always knew we were going to win the Senate race when I was well accepted at OU and during the Senate race and well accepted at OSU. And uh, the, the kind of was the drumbeat was going then when you can be from both schools and nobody's mad at you. <clears throat> uh, I really appreciate Rotary. I had a great friend, and some of you older Rotarians will remember him, but he taught me a lot, and he was part of this club. His name was Charles Cothy. How many of you all remember Charles Cothy? What a great, great individual he was, and all throughout his legal career, he exemplified the four foundation pillars of Rotary. And I saw it when he represented me in, in the state of Virginia <clears throat> in terms of our labor agreements and our labor non-agreements that we had in our manufacturing plant. But I, I always think about him as such a kind, soft, but strong individual that is representative of, of what Rotary stands for. So I'm, so I'm very pleased to be able to come and talk to you. I was going to talk to you about two things today, one Oklahoma and one national, and I'll try to be as brief as I can, so if we have any time for questions, we can. You know, I think there's been a great shift away in our politics in Oklahoma from what Oklahomans stand for, and it really disturbs me. Um, when I see people break their word to the people that elected them, when I see leadership in Oklahoma's legislative body <clears throat> start acting like leadership in Washington, where bills are written, written in leadership offices. There's no committee. There's no ability to read the bills. There's no ability to amend the bills. And then there's punishment if you didn't vote for the bill. That's not what Oklahomans are about. And that's what we saw in Oklahoma City in the last six weeks. And that's not what I want to be associated with. And, and the interesting thing, there's not a businessman or woman here <clears throat> that would run your business and raise your prices in a limited market knowing that you needed to increase your margin without first looking at your expenses. And it's been over 25 years since anybody's looked at any real expenses of the agencies that were run in Oklahoma. And most of you don't realize that there's 120 paid Oklahoma employees that do nothing but lobby the legislature all year long, all the time they're in and all the time they're out. <clears throat> There's also 50 paid individual lobbyists outside of the employees. So that's 170 people working for the agencies against a legislature that's in office working four and a half months a year with no oversight other than a budget committee meeting and no power to have oversight. The governor doesn't even have power to oversight our agencies. <clears throat> so we lack transparency in Oklahoma on how we spend our money. The governor vetoed a bill that would have made that available. We lack consistency. We lack accountability <clears throat> in Oklahoma. And it's easy to pass tax increases. I've been in Congress. I've been in the political field for, for 16 years. I know how it, easy it is to raise people's taxes. And I also now know how resistant people are when it comes to cutting expenses and holding people accountable, just like you would hold your employees accountable for being fiscally prudent with the money inside your business. 
And I'll tell you, that isn't happening in Oklahoma. And the teachers were a pawn in this. There's nobody in Oklahoma that I know of that don't think our teachers ought to be paid a whole lot more than what they're being paid. But there's also no accountability, the fact that we have 520 school districts. Texas has 10 times as many students, and they only have 200 school districts. What is up with that? Why is it that we can't gain efficiencies? Why is it that we have an average of around $150,000 per year in superintendents, and we have, in, in some counties, 20 school districts? We, we have missed the boat, and we're not spending money on the, what really matters. Our greatest asset is our children. It's our greatest, and we ought to have our investment in the people who are going to make an outcome difference on those children. And so therefore, we ought to have a vision that says our teachers in Oklahoma are going to be paid more than anywhere else in the country. So we can have the best teachers, and we can hold them accountable. And that is possible in Oklahoma. But it's not possible with the leadership that we've seen, both in the executive branch and the legislative branch, this year. Because what they've done is calmed down the desire for an increase, but there's been no accountability, there's been no modification, there's been no improvement to where we can actually be competitive. And when you think about that two out of three people who graduate from college in, in Oklahoma leave our state for opportunities that are greater, we ought to start turning that around. And, and the only way we will turn it around is if we become more competitive as a state, more economically competitive with better job opportunities for our kids. And there's no question there's lots of ways to raise the money to give every teacher a $7,000 a year pay raise without raising the first dollar in taxes. There's no question. It's been offered. There's a bill, SB 888, to get rid of the 95% of the money that goes in terms of subsidizing wind. It goes to 95% of that goes out of our state to the one percenters in our country. And we're paying that out at the expense of our own kids? I mean, it makes no sense. So I can give you a list and I'll be happy to do that, but I actually want to talk about our country as well as Oklahoma. And I'll be happy to give that list to you. Um, I look at Washington today, of having been gone from Washington for three years, and I'm really discouraged. I'm discouraged because you just saw a Congress pass $1.3 trillion worth of discretionary spending for six months. That's $2.6 .6 trillion annualized, of which only $900 million of it was paid for with tax revenues. And if you take the total unfunded liabilities that we have in our country today, which are at conservative. Kalitlikoff, who is a Nobel Peace winning, uh, 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 Nobel Prize winning economist in MIT, says our unfunded liabilities are three times what I estimate they are. So if you take that and divide it by the 85 million millennials that we have in our country today, what you come up with over the next 50 years is that every one of those 85 million millennials will suffer an economic loss of $33,000 per year. Now, that's going to happen one of three ways. That's going to happen, one, in terms of super high interest costs for the federal government, which will end up causing us to print more money and borrow more money, which will create inflation. Or we'll see a marked decrease in standard of living for our children, our most valuable asset. And my question is, is, is in fact, that a moral position that we should embrace, robbing from our children. Because that's exactly where the federal government is today. And so there, there are ways to solve that, but there's not the leadership or the courage or the statesmanship in Washington to address that because the number one thing Washington's interested in, no matter which party it is, is who's in control and who wins the next election. It's not about what's important for our country, what's in the best interest in the long term of our country. And if you, you believe any of the, the, the sophisticated economic experts in this country, 
No country in the last 800 years of economic history has survived where we are as a country with the total debt that we now have. And I'm not talking just government debt. I'm talking state government debt, county government debt, individual debt, corporate debt, personal debt, and federal debt. No country has ever survived that. So why is it that we have nobody standing up and leading on that issue in our country? To actually fix the real symptoms. Treat the symptoms and the disease, not just the symptoms. <clears throat> and I don't see that happening anytime soon. And, and you know, I, I hardly watch any news anymore because I can't stand it because it, each side is so one-sided. It, it, you you kind of have to put your blinders on and wear some, some old night harnesses to be able to listen to the news anymore, no matter what you're listening to. Because it's about how bad the other person is rather than what's the vision for our country. What is necessary to do what is right for our kids. You know, I, I've learned in my uh, 70 years of life that there's four things that I think are important for a republic to be able to survive. And the first is, is the rule of law. And we don't have the rule of law anymore. And we've lost confidence in a lot of the rule of law because now we have the rule of the rulers. Not the rule of law, but the rule of rulers. Just last week, uh, I, I printed an article off, seven crazy court rulings in one week that went against our Constitution. And these are, these are Republican-nominated judges, by the way that don't connect at all with our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, or our freedom, or our goodwill. <clears throat> so we now have a denuded Congress, a weak executive branch, and the most powerful branch in this country is the judiciary. And you can have one judge from one district decide everything. It, and, and there's a lot of examples, and I'll be happy to share that article with anybody that wants to read that. So th the first thing is the rule of law. And, and it, it's most manifested in terms of how we view immigration law. You know, I was really struck the last time I ran for office as I ran through Oklahoma, why immigration was such a big deal. It had nothing to do with Latino individuals. It had everything to do with the rule of law. And when people don't trust the rule of law, then they start applying that to themselves that, well, if they don't have to follow the law, then I don't have to follow the law. And that's how we end up with anarchy in the long run. The second point is a limited government. We have anything but a limited government. If you ask the, the people who have to make decisions for Tulsa County or Tulsa City, how much of the decisions that they make are dependent on what an unelected bureaucrat in Washington tells them what to do. They go nuts doing it. But they don't have because they've been bought off by the grants and your own transportation money that goes to Washington comes back with all these strings on it. So we don't have a limited government anymore. What we have is a government that has totally gotten outside of what the enumerated powers of our Constitution describe. And the only way to fix that is to restore those enumerated powers. The third thing is economic freedom. For a republic to survive, there has to be economic freedom. For 200 years, actually till 1996, this country led the world as the most free in terms of economic freedom. Economic freedom is divine, this, defined by saying how easy it is to start and expand and build a business. What are the inhibitions to it? We're now 17th. We dropped another spot last year. In spite of all the decreased regulations that came out of Washington, we dropped another spot. So, and many of you all feel that. But the very fact is, is in the average state in the United States today, 60% of the money that's raised in the state is not controlled by your elected officials. It's controlled by unelected bureaucrats creating mandates regulations from Washington that will then tell you what you must do if you're to get any of the other money from Washington. And you can't challenge it because the Commerce Clause was overridden by a case called Filburn in 1931 that totally changed the definition of that. And then the final thing for a republic to survive is a virtuous public. 
a virtuous and educated public. And if you think about the two areas of our economy where there's no accountability economically, and you think about the fact that education is now mandated and controlled more by Washington than it is by local schools or states, you can see why we are now over the last, since 1976, and $3.8 trillion spent by the Department of Education, there's not one parameter that can be measured that's improved in this country since the Department of Education was formed. Thomas Jefferson quoted, as he was building the University of Virginia, when asked why he didn't help, this was post his presidency, when he was asked why he didn't want, get somebody from Washington to help him, he said, you don't understand the Constitution. For the federal government to be involved in education, would require an amendment to the U.S. Constitution. Amazing how we got education from the federal government without an amendment to the Constitution. So there is a solution, and the solution is called Article V of the Constitution. And if we're to keep our republic, if we're to keep the promises and the, and the opportunity for our children, not just in Oklahoma, but in our country as a whole, it requires us as citizens to act. Because the reason I left Washington is Washington is never going to fix the real diseases that are plaguing our country today. And it will require citizen activism to actually solve that. And so a convention of states that actually limits the federal government, that the scope and the jurisdiction that puts term limits and forces a balanced budget, in other words, make the Congress make the hard choices they should be making, instead of the politically expedient. And I'll, I'll end with this one statement from Martin Luther King. It's my interpretation of it, but I think he's dead on when he describes Washington. He said, cowardice asked the question, is it expedient? And vanity asked the question, is it popular? But character asked the question, is it right? And I don't see us asking the right questions anymore. And we ought to be, and you ought to be, standing up and saying, we're gonna ask the right questions. And that's the way we save our republic. That's the way we restore Oklahoma. That's the way we keep our young people here and we create opportunities for our state and our kids. God bless you. And we've got time for a few questions if you'd like to. I have not yet. Did you all hear his question? Have you, have you endorsed any of the gubernatorial candidates? And I said, I have not yet. Well, that, yes, sir. Are there any current senators in Washington that you believe recognize and address the four issues you just described to us? Yes, there are. Um, um, uh, there are not a large number of them. I, uh, I, I think Rand Paul is one. Uh, I think Ben Sass is one. Uh, I, th I think that uh, uh, Johnson from uh, Wisconsin is one, uh, but they're, they're in the small minority because everybody's really morally, more interested in staying in Washington. You know, I, I saw with a personal friend who was a senator how power corrupts. What power does is causes you to have poor judgment. It creates an arrogance that then you have that arrogance and then your judgment is impaired. And then you see all these mistakes that are made. And we're seeing that in microcosm every day in Washington as you, as you see this battle with nothing getting done. I mean, you know, the political concept is, is Washington's through for the year. You know, not much else is gonna happen, right? Because they've got a campaign to run. Well, the, the country's $21 trillion in debt Last year's unfunded liabilities grew $7 trillion. Our kids' future is bleak economically, and our Congress is through for the year. What is that about? That's about failed leadership. That's about not giving us yourself away, even if it hurts you, even if it costs you. It's important for our leaders to take arrows and to be able to take those arrows and explain what they mean and mean what they say as they try to lead us. And we just have a large absence in both the Republican and the Democratic Party because the focus now is about the politicians, not our kids, not our future, not our country. It's about them. 
And that's why I left. Yes, sir. Well, I think your premise is absolutely wrong. It, it, the, only, the only way to really do right by the teachers is to hold the rest of the government accountable for the waste and duplication that's there. I mean, do you really think we ought to give $800 million shipped out of this country, over the next, out of this state to the next 10 years to the wealthiest people in the nation as a subsidy for wind when they already are forced, or your power plants are forced to buy the wind production that they're making? So, so I actually think it's the opposite. I think you hold the legislators accountable who voted for this for not doing the real job of oversighting what is happening in Oklahoma City and just bowing down and say, it's easy to raise taxes. Let's raise taxes. The teachers will be happy. But in fact, what you did was make Oklahoma even further non-competitive. So the fact is, is there's $580 million I can outline to you tomorrow that if the legislature would get busy, They'd have that money. You'd never feel a negative from it. The teachers would get $7,000 a year, and the state would be far more competitive than it is now with the tax increases we just passed. So there is a price. I'm all for teachers getting more than what the legislature passed for them, because I think that's how what we need, is we need the best that people in the classroom for our kids. I also think they need to be funded better. But I think the administrative costs associated with our school system and 520 school districts is a joke. None, no business person in here would have that, allow that. Why shouldn't we go copy Texas? Why shouldn't we get smart? We can still protect the values of the small schools throughout Oklahoma and the rural district and keep their identity by still managing the major things that cost a lot of money by consolidating the management but not consolidating the schools or the school boards. So I, I would just disagree with your assumptions is we need to hold the legislators who voted for this. And I, I plan on working as hard as I can to reverse this because that's the only way we'll ever get them to do the hard work of getting the money out of the waste. The last time any agency was ever looked at in Oklahoma was 25 years ago. Nobody's holding our state agencies accountable. And the governor doesn't have the power to hold them accountable. Do you, do you realize that they, the legislature in Oklahoma doesn't know what grants our agencies get from the federal government? And the governor wouldn't give that information to the legislature? What's that all about? Why shouldn't we have transparency in our state? I think we should have transparency on every penny that's spent in our state. We ought to know. Amen. Yes, sir. I understand your point about the number of school districts in the state, but I know superintendents in some of the smaller districts who drive the bus and do other things that have to be done, even if you were like Hawaii and had one school district. And uh, Texas, the last statistic the National Educational Specific Organization puts out, is 1,200, not 200 school districts. I understand that you are supporting the referendum to undo the tax increases that would undermine uh, all of the increases in pay that were passed by the legislature mm -hmm. this week. Are you afraid that your actions are putting the purpose above the good? 
No, I'm not at all. Uh, look, do you, what's going to happen to Oklahoma if we continue to stay worse and worse in terms of a competitive nature? Do you not worry about our kids all leaving here? They are. I mean, it's a fact. Why? Because we don't offer opportunity in Oklahoma because we have a dysfunctional, highly expensive, non-responsive, and non-transparent state government. And if you want to fix that, then you'll see your grandchildren living close to you rather than far away. And so you bet I'm going to try to defeat that because I want them to do the real work. Realize the people who voted against the tax increase and remember who wrote this. It wasn't the legislature wrote it. It was the well-connected in Oklahoma. It wasn't the average Oklahoman that's gonna, that, who's going to be paying this tax increase. It was the well-connected. And the people who didn't vote for it were punished. Their bills weren't even heard. Their bills. So, so now Oklahoma's acting like Washington? Give me a break. It's not the way we should operate. I think I'm out of time. Thank you all. God bless you. I know we could spend the rest of the afternoon here. This is, this is a debate that we need to have, and we appreciate you, Dr. Coburn, coming here and spending your time with us today. We appreciate your public service, and we appreciate your passion, and, uh, and the debate needs, does need to continue. So a book recognizing today's program will be presented uh, to our partner in education school, Celia Clinton. The book is One Vote, Two Votes, I Vote, You Vote. So I'd also like to re remind everyone, we have Magic City Books over here selling uh, one of Dr. Coburn's, I guess, your, is that your latest book? Latest. latest book. And Dr. Coburn will be over there. Uh, so if you'd like to buy one, he'll autograph it, and you can probably ask him more questions. And I'm sure he'd be more than happy to answer those. So we tried to allow a little bit of time for that. OK, upcoming programs. Next week's going to be another, another great program. Shannon Sedgwick Davis is the CEO of Ridgeway Foundation, a charitable giving arm of Ridgeway Capital Management. An attorney, Shannon is a passionate advocate for social justice and international human rights. She's a well-known strategist engaged in promoting peace and ending human atrocities across our globe. She serves on the advisory board of the Elders, a nonprofit organization founded by Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, Kofi Annan, and Jimmy Carter. And their goal is to bring peace to places of violence. Shannon's work has been featured many times on radio, television, and in print. So please join us next week. The following week, May 9th, we're going to celebrate our club foundation. And I would encourage you, this would be a great opportunity again to bring a guest for them to see what all we're involved in. Uh, this year, Stephen Robard and his committee have granted four grants to various nonprofits, and they are the Lindsay House, the South Tulsa Community House, New Hope, Oklahoma, and the Greenwood Cultural Center. And they will be here to tell us about what they do, how they're going to use the grants that we gave them, and they're also going to announce some hands-on service opportunities for us to get engaged with them and help them out to serve their clientele. So uh, hopefully you'll be here for that. So now I encourage you, go out, tell your Rotary story, and don't forget to bring a friend to Rotary next week. We are dismissed.